We are joined this hour by uh, one of my mentors down in Charleston and somebody I, I've really grown to uh, enjoy his company and enjoy his advice, Mr. Paul Espinosa. Mr. Paul Espinosa, Speaker Pro Tem. Welcome, Paul. Uh, thank you, Mike. Good to be with you, Bill. Good morning, Paul. John. Good to see you. So I've been I've been hounding you for a couple of weeks, and there's been rumors uh, swirling around the Eastern Panhandle as well as Charleston. Uh, hopefully, you got some big news for us, Paul. Well, I'm here today to announce that I do intend to be a candidate for state senate representing the 16th senatorial district uh, next year during the 2024 election cycle. That is fantastic. So you'll be running against a current senator, correct? Potentially. Uh, to be clear, uh, the formal uh, filing period uh, begins in January. But over the last several months, I have received uh, uh, just really overwhelming encouragement to consider running for the state Senate. And as I contemplated where I thought I could be most effective and also contemplated the fact that this uh, year, completing my 11th year in the legislature, next year will be my 12th year. I really felt that I was ready for a new challenge. Um, and your listeners uh, and viewers may recall that back in 2015, I actually explored the possibility of running for state Senate. And after our House Education Chair, Amanda Pasden, resigned her seat, I was asked by Speaker Armstead to consider remaining in the House to serve in that leadership role. When, after considering how, again, I thought I could best, you know, serve my constituents in the Eastern Panhandle at that time, opted to remain in the in the House. But now, uh, again, after uh, what will uh, what is now my sixth term in the House, I, I just feel that. Uh, serving in the Senate is a role where I can best ensure that the Eastern Panhandle does have a uh, uh, cohesive voice, uh, you know, in the state Senate. So uh, happy to let folks know where what my intentions are, so that all interested parties can can um, can you know make decisions accordingly. You know, I certainly uh, and you know this, Mike. Uh, we we don't own our seats. No. Uh, I've been very fortunate again to be elected uh, six times to my current seat, the 66th and now the 98th district. And I know from time to time, folks have come to me and asked, you know, Paul, what are your what are your plans? Uh, because I could sense that maybe they were thinking about running, and so. I, I thought it was important because of some of the speculation that's out there that it was important to let folks know what my plans were so that those individuals that are perhaps considering running uh, for the House of Delegates will know that that will certainly be an open seat. And also to let those folks that have been encouraging me know that I'm in and um, uh, they can proceed accordingly as well. Paul, for some of the folks who do not follow politics as close as what we might, the incumbent is who? Well, that's Senator Rucker, yes. uh, individual who I consider to be a very uh, close mm -hmm. friend. And again, uh, harken back to the 2016 election cycle where there was the potential of Senator Rucker and I running uh, against each other in that particular uh, race. And uh, just as I think she shared uh, you know, recently when she contested the Senate president race, yeah, it's really not personal. It's a matter of where we feel like we can serve our caucuses, and in this case, uh, the Eastern Panhandle constituency the best. And uh, I, that's where I believe that I can bring, you know, the skill set that I've uh, developed here during my tenure in the House uh, in my various roles as. Uh, as a majority whip and now as a member of the, of the senior leadership team in the House, you know, I consider myself a consensus maker, somebody that can work together cohesively as a team. And um, those are some of the skills that uh, I think I can bring to the race. And Bill, I will emphasize that, you know, while certainly politics uh, does often involve uh, uh, spirited contest, I've always tried to focus on what I can bring to the equation. You know, let others discuss you know what uh, uh what they can bring uh, you know to a particular race and again i'm i'm very proud of the record that i have the uh, record of conservative uh, the fiscal conservatism and i'll bring that same approach uh, should i be fortunate to be uh the nominee and elected uh, to the 16th senatorial district paul you said uh you know obviously you're going into your 12th year um how are things different now uh than when you first got elected and one of the some what are the, some of the major things that happened over the last 
12 years that you were proud to be a part of? Sure. Well, I'd say probably the biggest change uh, is the fact that my first uh, term, uh, the 13-14 cycle, uh, Republicans were in the minority. And so I'm actually probably one of the few folks in the House, not, not, not a handful, but definitely I think a minority of the members, the current membership of the House that has ever served in the minority. So I you know, frankly, uh, I think it gave me a really good perspective of what it's like to be in the minority. Some of the uh, some of the things that I think many of us who serve the minority uh, pledge to not uh, replicate uh, should we be in the majority, and that's just making sure that we're looking at policy as as, uh, as opposed to personalities or or politics. And you know, while certainly there are political themes uh, you know in the legislature it's a political body of course i think we have uh, held true to that um, to that philosophy of of you know letting uh, proposed policy stand on its merits and you see that today i know uh, I, I think i could speak for you i know i can speak for, for myself and co-sponsoring bipartisan legislation you know with with our colleagues across the aisle and that's one of the things that again i think serving in the minority that first term has helped me uh, understand. It's also given me appreciation or a hope of not serving in the minority again, because certainly you're able to, I think, accomplish a great deal more when you are in the majority and when you're helping to set the agenda, particularly when you're in a leadership role. And again, I've been very blessed or very fortunate under both Speaker Armstead and now Speaker Hanshaw to serve in leadership roles and help to really craft what our legislative agenda looks like. And then, again, in some of my leadership roles uh, as Majority Whip and as Speaker Pro Tem, helping to build that a c consensus, not only in the House, but also working very closely with our Senate colleagues to ultimately get it to the governor's desk so that we can actually get it enacted. So I think those are probably some of the differences just now being in a role where we can actually get things accomplished. And, and um, I have to give you credit, uh, you know, while I think you understate uh, your your um, contribution this session, uh, you and uh, other members of our of our uh, delegation have been uh, quick studies and you, you've done well and uh, certainly look forward to uh, perhaps uh, serving, uh, continuing to serve together in the legislature, but uh, just different ends of the Capitol. Uh, Paul, you, you're well recognized as being a gentleman that's, uh, uh, that gets, gets along well with people. You do it in a very civil manner, a very gentleman manner. And I think that's been a key to your success. We've had several Perspective candidates, and until January, everybody's perspective candidate, sure. nobody can file. That, that uh, we've asked their platform, with one exception, there all the platforms have been on the cultural side as opposed to the substance side. This is a change from what we've seen in years past. Would you view your platform in which way? What are some of your pla uh, some of your planks? Well, I you know. I'm, I we're often asked about that, Bill, because I know that that does, uh, particularly for folks that are not so much into social issues, would prefer that that the legislature focus on uh, on fiscal matters, uh, tax policy, um, other other issues. I will say this: uh, you know, I I do my very best to represent my constituents, and while my constituents heartily supported the tax reform uh, that we enacted this session. Uh, my constituents have been equally interested in ensuring that we protect life, for example, and so uh, you know they uh, certainly supported, by and large, the uh, policies that we put in place to protect the unborn. And so, I don't think it's really an either-or uh, type of scenario, Bill. Um, you know. I, th I think we have been uh, very uh, productive in addressing uh, some of the social issues. And I think as those social issues come up, I think there are issues that we'll have to continue to address. Um, I think we often hear when we talk about, uh, you know, girls, uh, you know, biological boys uh, playing against girls in sports, for example. Is that an issue that I ever thought that I would have to contend with when I was first elected uh, back in 2012 uh, or 2013? Uh, no, it wasn't. Uh, but that's the reality of the roles in which we're in. And so I think we'll continue to take take up social issues as, as, uh, as those uh, come to us. But 
I certainly believe that you know some of our uh, heavy lifts here recently have been in the area of trying to restructure our tax system, restructure our government to address those issues that will help West Virginia continue to prosper and to continue what you know I think most folks would recognize has been a tr- tremendous economic impact. So yeah, I yield to that. You folks, I think, have done a lot of good work on the uh, on the substantive side, the fiscal side, and uh, uh, DHHR and the like. So I applaud that. I was just struck by the fact, looking ahead, not looking backward. These candidates, you said, uh, can have both. The candidates we've spoken to are not opposing both. They have defaulted to the social and they never mention the uh, uh, the the more structural aspect. Well, I can only speak for myself. I know, I know, and, that's and, again, what, uh, yeah. and I will just say that I think as legislators we have to take what comes before us uh, and we need to obviously focus on things that we think will move West Virginia forward. And and I think it is important to address, uh, you know, all of those issues. Uh, I've been very pleased uh, finally to be able to enact some meaningful tax relief, uh, which is is already providing tax relief for taxpayers, and that will only expand in the years to come. We know that there are other issues before us, uh, the uh, correctional workers' challenges that we have and, and how we continue to move the needle on ensuring that we can fill state roles here, particularly in the Eastern Panhandle and other growth areas around the state, other areas around the state that are experiencing challenges filling those roles, uh, particularly in the border county areas. And so, again, I'm not going to shy away from any of those. And I've been a strong advocate for both those type of structural issues as well as uh, those issues which folks would refer to as social issues that are of, of, of have been uh, of great importance to me and my constituents here in the Eastern Panhandle. As an eyewitness to this particular slice of history, you saw the, the explosive change from blue to red in West Virginia. I mean, it's not even close anymore. Was that driven primarily by social issues, cultural issues? I don't think. Uh, I don't think so, John. I, th- I think if you look at our agenda, and, I, and I'd have to really pull that out, but it's my recollection, our first agenda in the, in the majority back in 2015, we addressed a lot of issues that I think are, being, are, 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 are bearing fruit today. For example, right to work. Uh, a lot of folks uh, often said, well, you know, nobody really asked about right to work. Well, you look at the new cores of the world and a lot of the other businesses that have decided to locate in West Virginia, If you ask them directly, you know, whether being a right to work state, whether that is important to them, they'll tell you that if you're not a right to work state, you probably are not even on the short list of states that they're going to seriously consider. So it it it, uh, I, I guess those opponents of right to work might be correct in that folks uh, prospective business don't ask about that because if you're not on that list of states that have enacted right to work uh, legislation you're probably not going to get involved in that conversation so i think a lot of those issues if you look back john those were the early issues that we really focused on uh right to work uh judicial reform we were uh unfortunately recognized as a judicial hellhole by the list by the by the folks that had maintained that list but because of the tort reform that we enacted, other regulatory reform, we are now off of that list. And I think, again, uh, now we're get starting to get looks from prospective businesses that, frankly, we just haven't in the past because we've one by one started to check those boxes that are very important to prospective employers to even consider locating in a state. So at this point, you sort of live in the dream. You're in the you've. you've Many years in the House, you've reached the senior leadership levels in the House. You're accomplishing a lot with with your caucus in the House. Why the switch to the Senate? Yeah, I, John, I think you bring up a good point. Um, you know, the, the easy decision for me would be to stay where I'm at, rest, rest on my laurels. I, I've got a, a pretty good role as Speaker Pro Tem. But it really comes down, you know, as I've contemplating it and uh, as I've considered the encouragement that, uh, voters uh, here in the Eastern Panhandle have have uh, have given me to consider uh, running for Senate. It's really about where I think I can be most effective. Now, again, 
I do believe I have a very effective record in the House, but the Senate obviously represents a larger area, not only Jefferson County, but uh, uh, a portion of Berkeley County as well. And I think uh, I think serving as a part of a, a of a larger team, I think that certainly something that uh, you know is attractive to me, and it's, it's something that I think that will help ensure that uh, the 16th senatorial district does have a strong voice in the West Virginia Senate as well as the legislature as a whole. So, John, what, what he's really saying is if Hornby can be in the House, I need to move up to the Senate. <laughs> um, and yeah. I will say, you know, Paul's actually, if you were to, to move up to the Senate, he'd actually be downgrading his office because he has the best office in the whole House of Delegates, including the Speaker. It's, it's right off the the uh, the House floor. It's beautiful. It's, you know, you can fit five uh, delegates in there. Yeah. <laughs> Paul, uh, I'm sure you have not, you have done a lot of research prior to making this decision and I also suspect you'll not answer you you will not answer my question but I'm going to ask it anyway uh, the endorsements who among some of our county leaders have endorsed you at this stage well you're right Bill you're not I'm going not to going to, going to announce that directly <laughs> uh, uh, s- suffice it to say that I have received significant uh, encouragement yeah. and certainly we will um, let those folks uh, speak for themselves but uh, Again, uh, it's something, the potential of, of, of running for the Senate, it's something that's really been, you know, in my mind since I uh, pre-filed for Senate back in 2015. And um, it's, it's something to where I thought that at some point that would be the next logical step if I decided to remain in the legislature. Uh, many of my colleagues from the House have moved on now to the Senate and are, are doing great things over there. And I certainly think having those relationships with former House members would also allow me to be effective in the Senate. But uh, again, I, I think it's just for me, it's about... Uh, being ready for a new challenge after what will have been 12 years in the House. And again, where I think I can be most effective. And I think I can bring those relationships. I can bring those skills that I've developed during my time in the House and the relationships that I've developed in the Senate because, you know, I've I've been very uh, fortunate uh, that, you know, I have been very successful in not only getting bills out of the House, which we all know is the first step in the process, but actually getting them through the Senate and across the finish line. I think this last session I uh, was successful in getting, I think, 35 bills that either I sponsored or the Senate version of the bills that I sponsored actually across the finish line and, and signed by the governor. And so that's the um, that's the approach that if I'm fortunate to, to garner the support of of my constituents uh, in the uh, voters in the 16th senatorial district, that'll be the approach that I'll bring uh, to the Senate. Paul, I'm going to congratulate you uh, in something I'm not at all surprised that you've done. We as talk show uh, inquirers have asked you several questions today that gave you the opportunity to take a pot shot at your potential opponent. You have avoided every one of those. You've taken very much the high ground and talked about your accomplishments. I applaud you for that. I think this is what we need more and more of. Well, Bill, I appreciate that. And uh, certainly, um, you know, if, if there are additional uh, uh, candidates for this race, uh, including the incumbent, uh, there'll be opportunities to draw contrast uh, down the road. But that has been, you know, my my um, approach uh, to elected office ever since I was elected, you know, first back in uh, in 2012 has been to really focus on me, focus what I can bring. Uh, to uh, you know whatever office that I'm seeking, and then I'll be the, that'll be the same approach that I'll take uh, during the upcoming election cycle. So, Paul, changing gears just a little bit, going back to the house. No matter what happens, if you want to lose, you won't be in the house, correct? Um, That's right. You so, should only run for one at a time. So, with that in 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 the. The, the rumors and some of the people have already said that they're not running. It seems to me like a lot of our uh, established leadership is either moving on or moving out. How do you see um, how do you see people stepping up or what do you see for the future of the, our, our house, if you will? Well, I'm very enthusiastic about where the house is currently. Um, you know, when, when we had 88 members and now we have 89 members, uh, 
certainly there was the potential for things to really go sideways, uh, particularly in the aftermath of the defeat of Amendment 2. Um, I, I, knew, I think we all realized that that was going to be very difficult to move beyond. But I think the way that uh, particularly the House conducted itself this year with such a large uh, supermajority, I really have to commend Speaker Hanshaw, uh, Majority Leader uh, Eric Householder, in our uh, caucus chairs for the way in which they really help bring cohesiveness to our uh, to our caucus, and, and you, I know, understand that better than most because of your your involvement on a daily basis in that, and because of what uh, what I kind of saw this last session. Uh, I think there are clearly a, a host of folks, including yourselves and you know, some of our newer members, you know, from the Eastern Panhandle, that are more than poised to be able to do as I have over the over the last number of years, and as as leadership opportunities present themselves, be able to move into those roles and continue to progress. And uh, I have no uh, doubt that uh, we have ample leadership uh, in the House uh, among our membership to where. Those folks that do decide to either, uh, for whatever re reason, decide not to continue in the legislature or to move on to another role, uh, that there'll be ample, ample leadership to ensure that we'll be successful going forward. And certainly uh, look forward to seeing uh, you progress uh, over the coming <laughs> years as well, Mike. It's going to be interesting. Um, you know, I know when Barrett won, he came back in the house and introduced himself to everybody. You know, he, he, he forgot about where he came from, I think, a little bit sometimes. But <laughs> I jest, Jason, I jest. <laughs> Bill. Do you? <laughs> I don't. <laughs> I don't. I didn't think so. <laughs> uh, Paul, what you, what's, um, moving forward, what are, are your – where is your – uh, just to remind some of the audience, where is your district, your senatorial district? What, what, what will you be doing for the campaign? Sure. Well, the uh, district includes all of Jefferson County as well as, I would say, kind of the southern half of, of Berkeley County uh, for the most part. If you go to the legislative website, you're able to actually see those those uh, maps and certainly will plan to include a copy of that map on my website uh, once I get that uh, kind of updated and, and, and rolling. But, um, you know, I'm going to take the same approach that I have in the past, um, you know, for particularly for my competitive races that I've had in the House, you know, I, uh, particularly my early, early races, I made it a point to hit every walkable household in my district, and I'll take that same approach. Uh, I'll probably need a few more pairs of shoes. I usually go through wow. one uh, one pair of shoes, uh, a new pair of shoes. I usually go through those each election cycle. But for a district that's uh, obviously um, you know considerably larger than a delegate seat, uh, I'll have to invest, I think, in a little bit more footwear. But uh, we'll do my best to you know get out, uh, meet folks one to one, and. Uh, you know, I, I pride myself on uh, pride myself on being accessible. Uh, folks know how to reach me, and uh, uh, it doesn't take long to hear what are the issues that are important to folk. And the folks, uh, you know, if you just give them time, uh, give them a few minutes to speak with you. So certainly, we'll be uh, pounding the pavement and just letting folks know that I'm in it to win it. And um, look, would we would be honored to have their support uh, next year. Well, that brings us to the end of our third segment. 